Father, indeed, we just thank you and praise you for this time. We praise you, Father, for who you are. We thank you, Father, for bringing us to this moment in time when we might just pause and share your word and the son that you have given us. We just ask your blessing upon this hour that you would just pour out your spirit, open our hearts and minds that we might behold Jesus Christ. Help us to fully apprehend the person of Jesus Christ. We would ask you to just help us in all these things to grow in grace and the knowledge of him in whose authority we ask these things. Amen. Oh, the Lord's got fun for, for us ahead of us. You know, it's uh, it's always interesting to see the menu he serves up. And uh, uh, we're going, as you may have heard, uh, we're going to take a... We've been in the Old... We sort of alternate between the Old and New Testament, right? So it's... it's uh, a shot at, uh, at the New Testament, and we're going to uh, take a look at the uh, Epistle to the Colossians. Epistle to the Colossians. And uh, it's, it, it's uh, uh, a fun epistle. Uh, it's a very unusual epistle in many ways. Um, in fact, the difficulty will be there's so much here that uh, uh, we can't possibly exhaust it, and that's not my style anyway. We're going to just try to Glean it, if you will, and go go through it. But um, uh, as you know, um, Paul wrote 13 epistles with his name on them. And uh, as you know from our Hebrew study, I'm one of those that holds to Paul's authorship of the book of Hebrews for lots of reasons. Uh, but the point is, it's uh, interesting. Paul was not a philosopher. He was a rabbi. His, his thought structures are Jewish. Um, and uh, we really, interestingly enough, really see that in the book of Hebrews, but which doesn't have his name, doesn't need to in that sense. Uh, Colossians uh, is going to deal with some issues that you're going to discover some strange things about the book of Colossians. Um, but first of all, you're going to, just to get ahead of ourselves a little bit, just to stimulate a few thoughts here, the book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians are very, very similar. Very similar. For a lot of reasons we'll see. In fact, superficially, some people think, gee, they cover the same ground. Um, in fact, they were written at the same time, probably carried by the same messenger at the same time. Three epistles were Colossians, Philemon, and, and Ephesians. Um, on the one hand. On the other hand, they're quite different. And it's the differences that are sort of provocative. Number one, the book of Ephesians is all about the church in the heavenlies. Huh? And uh, Corinthians is about the church in its earthly burdens, but uh, Ephesians that speaks of the church, the body of Christ in the heavenlies, and it's full of the Holy Spirit. Colossians is a very similar kind of book, except it has a couple of provocative things. It really speaks of the headship of Christ, his preeminence. Um, but the uh, thing that's strange is in the book of Colossians, you won't, you won't find the Holy Spirit spoken of doctrinally at all. He appears maybe once, and it's almost an incidental reference. So don't misunderstand me. The Holy Spirit is very, very busy in the book of Colossians presenting to you and I the person of Jesus Christ, but in a different way than we experienced in in Hebrews, because Paul is responding to a a little different uh, urgency than, than, than he does in any of his other letters. And uh, uh, I think you're going to see uh, it's just amazing how the Holy Spirit will anticipate. We're, we're going to come to two ideas, first of all. Number one is that Satan can offer up nothing new. The particular gravity and anxiety that Paul felt, which caused moved him to write the Epistle of the Colossians, was because of the advent of some heresies starting to occur at that time. But what's interesting as we get into this is uh, how anticipatory those very heresies are in in terms of what you and I will be facing. Um, but I'm getting ahead of the story a little bit. Um, the uh, This is a letter that was written in Paul's imprisonment. It was written, you now some people think it was while he was in Caesarea. There's more evidence to indicate it was probably when he was at Rome. He was at Rome at some, for some time, imprisoned there. And um, it was during that imprisonment that we believe, certainly Philippians was written, but also we believe... Both Colossians, Philemon, and Ephesians were written. And the three letters, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon is almost an appendage to Colossians, were uh, 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 sent by a courier at about the same time. Um, 
Well, let's talk a little bit about Colossia first of all. It was an inland city of Western Asia Minor. Now, when we say Asia Minor, uh, it's very misleading to our minds because we think of Asia, the continent of Asia. When you see Asia in a biblical sense, it's got nothing to do with the continent of Asia. It has to do with the Roman proconsular province of Asia. If you think, if you substitute the word Turkey for Asia, you're close. It's not exact, but close. So when we say uh, it's you know, when you see in the New Testament to the churches in Asia or or in the in the first two chapters uh, chapters two and three of the book of Revelation, uh, Asia is a Roman province. It was a jurisdictional area, uh, proconsular uh, province of of Rome. The capital of the Roman province of Asia was a town by the name of Ephesus. So therein lies you know a little bit of the linkage. Uh, inland, uh, there, there's a river uh, called Lycus, L-Y-C-U-S, like the River Lycus. It's the southern effluent of uh, the Meander River, a very famous river, and from which, of course, we get the word, but the uh, Meander River. Um, and there's a, it, uh, it's uh, on the high road from Miletus to Ephesus, um, to the central highlands. It's inland quite a bit. In fact, you'll discover that there's very little reason for it to have to survive because it's not on a major thoroughfare. And in fact, three cities, Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossus, were of the three cities of the Lycus River. And all three seem to disappear about 60 A.D. and there or, uh, or thereabouts. And um, are, um, uh, uh, there's some argument as to the exact timing. Uh, there were some earthquakes and things. They anyway disappear from, from prominence in subsequent periods. Um, now, what's interesting about the, the church at Colossa is that it was not founded by Paul himself. You'll discover from the comments here, it's maybe not obvious, but it'll help you to, to appreciate uh, Paul's comments, to recognize that he himself was probably never there. Um, uh, there was a, um, uh, a group of Colossian belie- uh, uh, people that were in Ephesus when Paul was in Ephesus for some substantial length of time. This is uh, probably for three years, from A.D. 54 through 57 or 55 through 58, depending on various authorities. Um, Paul was in Ephesus, and while in Ephesus, had a number of converts that were citizens of Colossae. Uh, perhaps the most important is Epaphras. Um, he is a Colossian by birth, we defined. He, super, he probably founded the church at Colossae, superintended it from the beginning. Uh, he began his, 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 his Christian walk under Paul's direction, presumably at Ephesus, and then uh, went back home to Colossae, founded the church, was its pastor, if you will. Uh, apparently, from Paul's remarks in various letters, uh, uh, he had remarkable zeal and success. And we find him referred to all through chapters 1, 2, and 4 in the book of Colossians, naturally. Now, what apparently happens is Epaphras visits Paul when he's in Rome. Paul is in Rome, prisoner, and uh, Epaphras comes to visit him. Now, Paul has received his, this convert from his uh, ministry at Ephesus. He is thus obviously aware of the church at Colossae. And Epaphras brings to Paul a status report and describes um, uh, the... Uh, the uh, Stability, the growth, and also the affection that the Colossians feel towards Paul, being, as in a sense, their spiritual father. But he also brings to Paul some frightening re- reports. Some th- he mentions some things that causes Paul great anxiety and concern. And that gives rise to Paul writing a letter to the church at Colossae. Now, it's interesting because he hasn't met these people. He's learned of them. He cares for them. We're going to, that's what, so all this make, is going to make a very inter, a different reading as you read the book of Colossians. It sounds very affectionate, very passionate, very concerned. Right, he hasn't met these people. This is by, by in a sense, indirection. Now, there's another gentleman that's probably worth mentioning. It was also at Ephesus that uh, uh, gets uh, returned to Colossae, and that's uh, there's, uh, that, uh, there's a guy by Onesimus, a runaway slave. And uh, Paul, uh, he's a convert, and Paul... Um, in fact, uh, uh, this, this may have occurred actually in Rome, 
But when he writes the letter to Colossians and Ephesians, he also writes a letter to his buddy Philemon and says, you know, Onesimus is a Christian now. He's, uh, he's talked him into going back to his master. And Paul writes this very brief but touching and interesting letter called Philemon. So Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon are all uh, apparently sent on that same, uh, by the same messenger. Tychus, Tychus, I guess you pronounce it, um, is the bearer of those three letters. Um, and uh, um, that's, oh yes, one other thing that's worth mentioning about uh, a little background on, on uh, Colossa. The powerful influence in the ancient world was Alexandria, actually in those days in Egypt, uh, but a very powerful center of culture, obviously Greek. Um, it's also, though, was a major Jewish center. And um, in the wealthy, influential Jewish circles, uh, the, the, it all had its roots back to Alexandria. The very uh, undertaking of the uh, Old Testament being translated into Greek, take, undertaken uh, in the third century before Christ was born. Seventy Jewish scholars were impaneled and funded to spend a number of years, I've forgotten how many years now, three or five, a a substantial period of time, to translate the Hebrew Old Testament, as we would call it, into the Greek. Because in those days, if you were a a Jewish citizen of the world, you spoke Greek, not Hebrew. Only the rabbis or special scholars spoke Hebrew. It wasn't a dynamic language. And, uh, but all the scriptures were in Hebrew, and they had as much comfort with that as, as uh, perhaps uh, you and I might have with Latin. Okay, as a, in a sense, if, if, I, if I might do the, draw it by analogy. So they impounded these 70 scholars to translate the Old Testament into Greek. That translation is called the Septuagint version. We've all talked about the Septuagint. That is the, the uh, translation that uh, Paul and others quote from in the New Testament. Uh, when they quote from the old, they quote, they often quote from this, this, uh, Greek, um, translation. Well, where was that done? It was done in Alexandria, not in Jerusalem, Alexandria. It was a major, major capital. Now, the point is, is, uh, that there were a large, uh, body of Jewish settlers that were exiled by Antiochus the Great, um, under those days of, the days of persecution, and they settled in the Lycos Valley and, and, and cities like Colossus. So, uh, and they also be, were very numerous. They were very wealthy. And if we understand correctly remarks made by the Talmud, they were not very orthodox. So understand what you've got, the ingredients you've got in Colossa is first of all an influence of Judaism, but not orthodox Judaism necessarily. You have what we're going to discover is oriental mysticism. And, um, we're also going to have, um, there's three, what am I missing? Oh, and the Greek philosophy, the Greek philosophies. So all these influences are active at Colossae and give rise to some uh, 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 strange ideas. And uh, in fact, let's just get into that. What was emerging in Colossa, which was also extant elsewhere, is a set of beliefs which go under the label of Gnosticism, G-N-O-S, Gnosticism. And um, Gnosticism was predicted by Paul. You might turn with me to Acts, the book of Acts. Um, oh, we might start with verse 19. That's, this describes Paul being at Ephesus. One thing we should recognize is that uh, during the three years or so that Paul was at Ephesus, in Acts 19. That's a very, very key period of time, not just for the Ephesian church. In verse 10 of chapter 19, um, Luke tells us that, and this continued for the space of two years, so that all they who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. That's quite a comment. Ephesus was the capital of Asia, but everybody heard. Doesn't mean necessarily responded to, not heard in that sense, but but uh, had the opportunity. And, of course, uh, there's a whole uproar at Ephesus and so forth, and that's what chapter 19 is about. But when you get to um, to uh, chapter 20, we have the occasion where Paul bids his farewell to the church at Ephesus. And um, we might um, take note of verse 17 in Acts 20. 
And for Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, and he said to them, uh, Ye know him that from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you in all seasons. Verse 19, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and trials which befell me by the lying in the weight of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to Jews and also to the Greeks, uh, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except that the Holy Spirit witnesses it in every city, saying that the bonds and afflictions await me. In other words, everybody's trying to talk him out of it, but he goes anyway. And none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel uh, of the grace of God. In fact, if you read Philippians, so we almost get the impression he has a death wish. He says, I, I am a straight betwixt two, having desire and, you know, to, uh, to, to be and uh, to depart and to be with Christ, which is far, but to be with you and yet to be with Christ, which is far better. In other words, he almost is, he can hardly wait for the Lord to take him. I mean, he didn't really sweat the details in terms of, he just, let's get on with it. Verse 25, and now behold, I know that ye, that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I testify unto you this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not sh- uh, uh, shunned to declare unto you the whole, the, all the counsel of God. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. What a precious thing. One of the things that makes Paul's ministry so valuable is he didn't ride little hobby horses. He was responsible for the whole counsel of God and how we might learn from that. But either where I'm really headed is the next few verses. Take heed, therefore. Now, he gives, he gives the Ephesian church, and by extension, that whole area, the whole Asian province, not just the Ephesus, the whole Asian province, uh, the following warning and exhortation. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Those are pretty graphic idioms. You know, he's not talking about, you know, somebody entering the fellowship that has some deviant ideas that will cause you some, you know, mixed confusion and so forth. I mean, he could use several different you know, rhetoric here, uh, rhetorical idioms, if you like. He's saying here, though he's speaking quite articulately, and look, he, that grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise. In other words, Christians. Members of the body. Within the group, apparently. Also of our own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that for the space of three years I ceased not to warn you, everyone, excuse me, to warn everyone, day and night with tears. This wasn't a little casual footnote. Hey, by the way, be careful, there's going to be trouble coming. He says for three years, well, all the time that he was with them, he warned them day and night with tears. Of what? Of heresies. Heresies coming in. And, uh, and, and, and on he goes. Now, it's interesting, then we get to the book in the Revelation, and Jesus Christ uh, writes the, uh, dictates his seven letters to the seven churches. The first one was to that church, the church at Ephesus, right? And apparently Ephesus um, uh, gets commended for trying those that are apostles, say they are apostles and are not, remember? They did well doctrinally. They apparently at Ephesus, seemed to heed those exhortations. But, of course, they lost their first love. Doctrinal, correct, doctrinal correctness is no substitute for the love of the brethren. And, of course, and, and, and the Lord warns them that, that uh, if they don't change their ways, he's going to remove their lampstand, right? In, in Revelation chapter 2. Any of you visited the church at Ephesus? Not there. Lampstand was removed. Now, this is not unrelated to Colossians. They're not co-located, but they're in the same province. Um, in fact, Colossians is going to be much more closely related to Laodicea, and I'll come to that later. Um, what 
what turns out to emerge and what Paul, having warned Ephesus, but by extension that region in, in Acts 20, gives rise to the letter that you and I have on our laps called Colossians. And what it's going to be dealing with is Gnosticism. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time describing Gnosticism as it existed in that time for several reasons. We have, we're more interested in the, ver- the various, the variations we see bouncing around our horizon today. It's still here in its, its strange forms. Um, but we might, the, uh, Gnosticism, first of all, uh, had a uh, philosophical character, or I should explain that the word um, Gnosticism uh, comes from the uh, gnosis, which means knowledge. Gnosticism is a pretension to knowledge. The Gnostics felt they were superior. They felt that they were above conventional thought. They were, it was sort of an eclectic theosophy. And uh, uh, now we, the word Gnosticism, of course, is being, we're going to use that a little bit here. Uh, Huxley coined the word agnosticism, meaning I do not know or without knowledge, without knowledge. And uh, we often speak of a deist, someone who believes in God. We speak of an atheist, someone who believes militantly there is no God. You heard there are, there are actually not many atheists around, not truly. Um, and I love this one. I, I, I pointed out to, in fact, I, I was kidding the guys up at Canias up in Carson City that they have a, you've heard of dial a prayer. They have a number for, in New York, they have a number for the, for the atheists. When you dial, uh, uh, nobody answers, the phone rings, no one answers. <laughs> and I thought I was being cute and they told me there is a number for atheists in Carson City and they do have a little thing. So there are these things. So I was wrong. I was being a little flippant when they, in fact, they were quite serious. But atheism isn't so much the issue. There, there is this body of, of intellectual pridefuls that believe it's not possible to know, not possible to resolve. And they, they love to use the label agnostic. It was, it's very fashionable in certain intellectual circles to, to uh, say, I'm an agnostic, meaning that uh, you know, I, sorry, I choose not to get into the debate, is what they're trying to say. The word agnostic means without knowledge. The Latin equivalent is ignoramus. <laughs> it's not too fashionable at a cocktail party to say, I'm an ignoramus. You know, we, <laughs> We don't really get quite the same status in, in, in Orange County uh, weekend party circles by saying I'm an ignoramus as we would by saying I'm a, you know, uh, get a good sneer, a good haughty sneer and say I'm an agnostic. You can pull that off if you really want to get play that game. But, but the point is uh, 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 agnosticism, of course, is a, is a position which tries to say it's not possible to, these issues aren't possible to be resolved objectively and how tragic a position that is. But, uh, now the Gnostic says I do know. Gnosticism is a pretension to knowledge. Now, what's interesting is that Paul apparently coins a word, epignosis, which means, and when he speaks of Christian knowledge, he uses the word epignosis, which strictly translated means super knowledge. So the Gnostics claim to know and be pretentious. Paul speaks of the Christian revelation as epignosis. When, he used, when Paul used the term knowledge, he's using the word that really means super knowledge. We speak of, you know, super mom or super that. Well, Paul's talking about super knowledge. So Paul's really quite contemporary in terms of his, his choice here. Uh, now, uh, getting, but so that you get a little bit of a flavor. Now, if you study, if you go through, uh, I don't know if you've got the great books of the Western world or Botanic or whatever, and you start doing some digging on what the Gnostics believe, you're going to get confused because, to help you save a little time, there were several different variations of Gnosticism, and where they ended up was diametrically opposed. And I'll try, try to explain. But they all have, the Gnostics basically were, had a philosophical character, very arrogant philosophical character. There was a good dash of Judaism in it. There's a legalistic tone to it. They get all hung up, involved with the worship of angels, and with exaggerated powers. What and all of these things have subtle undermining's of the deity of Jesus Christ. That I'll come to. Um, they also some variations ha- had a, a affinity towards a- ascetic rules, denial of the bodily bodily life. They were they were ascetics. Um, but all of this was aimed, in a satanic sense, to undermine or limit the greatness and authority of Jesus Christ. And the sufficiency of his redemption. Those are the issues. 
the greatness and the authority of Jesus Christ and the sufficiency of his redemptive work. Some of the Gnostics believed that Christ was just a man and not God. They they had a whole elaborate, complex way of getting to that point of view. Other Gnostics went the other way around. They said he was spirit, not flesh. Okay? Now, Paul deals vigorously with the one hand, and John in his three letters deals vigorously with the other. Between Paul and John, we got him cornered. Okay? Um, Now, but if when we use the term Gnostics, I want you to remember these were Christian teachers. Okay? And and, uh, uh, they were professing uh, a higher and more secure spiritual life. That was a theme. That was the drum they were thumping. Okay, so it's easy to give them names and figure those guys are way out in left field. Hey, they were in the Christian church, and this whole game plan was was fancy words for ideas that go one step beyond the plain, simple, solid truth of the gospel. So that's that's what we're into here uh, with the with the Gnostics. Basically, Eastern Theosophy, a mix of Greek philosophy and Oriental mysticism and some Judaism that got commingled in Alexandria. And Philo is one of the contemporary writers of Paul and Jesus Christ that uh, documents all this. The ideas of I- India, Persian, Egyptian. There's an Underlying all of this, there's an intrinsic uh, concept of the evilness of matter and a separation of the Godhead and creation, as if they're, they're quite the, the created world. Um, heavy emphasis on all kinds of angels and ranks, all kinds of intermediaries that you've got to work your way through to get to God. See, that's all starting to undermine the, the, the role of Jesus Christ. Um, heavy emphasis on ceremonial rites for man to rise above his material obstructions in a spiritual walk. So that's how you get to the ascetic,ness the denial of normal material bodily life. And uh, you can, But, you know, as we talk about this, do you hear the Hindu in the back, background? You see? Do you hear the Persian Zoroastrian ideas in the background? Um, and uh, those of you that are familiar with the Orphic or Pythagorean uh, uh, mystic doctrines and some other things we get in. Now, I'll tell you what makes this so interesting. Those of you that might be very sensitive to current waves of thought, you probably have heard the term the New Age. And what is it? This. Eastern mysticism tight, all entangled and repackaged in advanced technology. And those of you that aren't into this sort of thing, let me give you a different example. You remember Star Wars? You remember the concept? That there's a concept in Zoroastrianism called duality. The force. There's the dark side of the force. The, you know, the dark and the light, same force, but it's two sides. That Those notions weren't invented by the writer of the Star Wars trilogy. They go back to the ancient Persian mysticism. And... Uh, so uh, uh, the duality of the forces. The net of this is, what's interesting, there's two things about this that's interesting. One is that these ideas, that, t- that if, you're, if you're really into modern doctrines uh, in, the, in the occultic sense, you're into the, age, the Aquarian age and, and all these New Age writers. But what's interesting is all their premises are no, nothing new than what was called in the first century Gnosticism. Or, I mean, it's the same thing we're talking about, point one. So the first point that we're going to learn is that Satan has nothing new to offer. He's, he's bankrupt. No surprise. What's even more exciting is the Holy Spirit has anticipated all of this. So if you're barraged by New Age literature, hey, dig out your Epistle of the Colossians and read on. Because he takes care of it all. Okay? Uh, now, this, what's interesting, that's why as we start to study the book of Colossians, uh, we're kind of fascinated. Here's Paul, the writer, who's a rabbi, right? There's no Old Testament allusions here. Or if they are, they're really hidden. I mean, you wouldn't, they don't leap out at you. Uh, he's a, but Paul is a rabbi, not a philosopher, and yet here. What Paul is, his, his, his message is going to deal with the person of Jesus Christ as being all in all. And uh, the, as far as Paul is concerned, when Epaphras gave him the message of what was going on in Colossia, Paul felt that the divine glory was at stake. And that gives rise to this epistle. It's interesting, obviously, it's driven by the Holy Spirit, but as the Holy Spirit does so effectively all through the Scripture, he doesn't bear witness of himself. So he's behind the scenes, not visible. As he surfaced in some sense, you might say, in the Epistle to the Ephesians. Um, Now, a couple of thoughts. uh, there, There are three epistles that I always sort of have trouble keeping apart in terms of their emphasis. Ephesians, 
Hebrews, and Colossians. They're all fabulous, fabulous epistles. The epistle to the Ephesians is, of course, the church in the heavenlies. And yet when you talk about the church or the preeminence of Christ, those kinds of ideas, you find them in Colossians. Yet you also find them in Hebrews. So I'm going to suggest to you that if you recognize that Ephesians is the church in the heavenlies, where in 1 Corinthians it's the church on the earth, it's earthly role. When you talk about the epistle to Hebrews, which we went through not long ago, the theme there was the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Everybody says, well, wait a minute, Colossians is known as the, 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 the theme of Colossians is Christ's preeminence. Yes, it is. I'm not denying that. It is. But Hebrews was also. He was more preeminent over Moses or the angels. He took The writer to Hebrews took everything Jewish and showed that Christ was preeminent of everything. Okay? That's going to show up in Colossians, but in a slightly different way. In Colossians, we're going to be focusing on his headship. His headship. Now, what's intriguing to me, and this is a new idea for me, and I haven't tested it, but I'll throw it out because it either has merit or it doesn't, and it does if only if you judge it for yourself as we go. I'm intrigued with the three basic offices that go all through the Scripture, prophet, priest, and king. Hmm? And I would suggest to you that the epistle to Ephesians shows Christ in his office as the prophet or forth teller or what have you. Hebrews as the priest, our high priest. And Colossians as our king. So that may help. By the time we get through this, you may say, gee, it doesn't really fit. If so, abandon the idea, because I'm trying it on for size. But it seems to suggest itself. Um, Okay. The Jewish legality, Grecian philosophy, and Oriental mysticism. Three basic themes that weave together that are... Here, dealt with by Paul. Um, one other idea. This is all I realize getting started is kind of slow, but I want to get sort of this out so you have perspective. Uh, those of you that have been with us during the seven letters to seven churches may recall how those seven letters to seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Right? Those seven letters to seven churches had many roles, about four different levels of, in, of insight that we went through, and I won't repeat all that tonight, other than to highlight, bring your remembrance, that they also, in addition to describing all churches, all seven describe all churches, all churches, including right here in River City, have elements of all, all seven. We're not the Philadelphian church. I hate to break you know, the news to you. We're, we may hope that we're like that in some ways, but we're also got some layer to see around here. We've got some of this and some of that. The point is, they, they, those seven letters m- give you an orthogonal domain in which you can map the spiritual condition of any believer or any fellowship. And we developed that well, I think, last when we went into that. But there's something I want to remind you. It also spoke of them. It also spoke of the church period prophetically. The first four churches spoke were historical. And I mean the first three, and then the, the last four are, co-linear, are, are, are contemporaneous to the end, if you recall, with Thyatira specifically being promised that she would go into the Great Tribulation, and Philadelphia offered the promise that she would not. And of course, as you, we laid those seven churches out in various, they described spiritually the various uh, conditions the church has you know, evolved through, if I can use that phrase, um, over the last 1,900 years. And what, of course, gets a lot of attention is Laodicea, right? Because Laodicea has got some characteristics that are at the end, right? And it obviously is, is the seventh of the seven churches, so it's it's all over. And we see a lot of Laodicea around here. And uh, that I won't repeat all that study. If, you're, if, the, if that's familiar to you, you recall that. If it's not, I suggest you get the tapes on Revelation 2 and 3. We also, at that time, compared those seven letters, seven churches, to the seven kingdom parables of Matthew 13, where Jesus Christ gives his disciples seven parables covering the same ground, and we were fascinated to see the structural parallels between those seven parables and the seven letters. It's a mystical, uh, a fingerprint, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. Now, we also touched at that time, but lightly, if I recall, on a third level of, we've got the seven letters, seven churches, seven kingdom parables. We also pointed out that there are 21 epistles in the New Testament, uh, 10 of them written by Paul, uh, three, uh, uh, excuse me, 13 of them by Paul, we set aside Hebrews because it's not signed. The 13 epistles of Paul were written to 10 addressees. Three of those are pastors or individuals. That means that Paul wrote seven churches. And intrigued with that observation, he says, gee, is there, the, uh, some of those are duplicates, First and Second Corinthians, First and Second Thessalonians, fine, but there's seven churches that Paul wrote to. And if you recall, we made a little diagram and we noted 
that each of the seven churches that Paul wrote to fit the seven churches book of Revelation. Ephesus, Ephesians, that fits, right? Smyrna, joy through suffering. Philippians, that seemed to fit. Uh, Pergamos, the worldly church. Corinth, huh? Then uh, uh, Thyatira, the, the, uh, the call from religious externalism was Galatians. We have Sardis and Romans, and then we have uh, uh, Philadelphia, the raptured church, and we have the Thessalonian letters, huh? And that left us with Laodicea. And what, what's left? Colossians. Seems contrived. Colossia was a suburb of Laodicea. They're one mile from each other. They were, they, in fact, in the book letter, you can discover that the Colossians and the Laodiceans are instructed to exchange letters. As far as the addressees are concerned, they're synonymous. Well, isn't that interesting? You're trying to tell me that in the Laodicean period, the key doctrine will be the New Age that Colossians anticipates? I think that's kind of exciting. I can hardly wait to get into this. Let's. Uh... Okay. Um, um, okay, let's see. Uh, there's nothing left that I can throw at you. Any more, no more distractions and nonsense. There's, let's jump in and, and uh, see what Paul says. The first word is Paul. Um, We'll get a little further tonight, maybe, but I will point out. (laughs) Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and and Timothy, our brother. Uh, Thirteen epistles start with the word Paul. That was Paul's style. That was his, his, his salutation. Paul, you know, from me to you, you know. Paul... Da, 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 to whoever, right? Hebrews, in which he's not interested in leaning on his apostolic authority, he goes out a whole different way, starts instead with God, who in sundry times and ages past, right? Same style, but for his purposes in Hebrews, speaks from a different vantage point using the authority of the word, not his apostolic authority in the book of Hebrews. It's kind of interesting. See, so interestingly enough, it's the same structure, which for lots of reasons I won't recap now. I, I, I do favor the, the Pauline authorship of Hebrews, but we're in Colossians. Let's keep moving. Paul, <clears throat> an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, he always takes that position. Now, you can read in Acts where they laid hands and so forth. He never was ordained by laying on hands. He was encouraged, refreshed, energized, blessed, fine, but not, he was an apostle, not of men or by men, but by the will of God. A little side thing there. Apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timothy, our brother. Now, um, um, uh, Timothy is associated here with him as he is in the Philippian letter. uh, Timothy was converted at Lystra. And then on the next time Paul visits Lystra, he's commended, uh, Timothy's commended to him. And so he takes him in the ministry, and throughout a long relationship, Timothy proves to be reliable and devoted. So Timothy will be very conspicuous throughout the whole Pauline period, uh, and, and as I'm sure in this point, a, a, an old friend of ours. Um, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, that's, that's the from section. It's like a corporate memo. You know, from, to, you know, from Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, Timothy, your brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossa. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the saints and faithful brethren. That's an interesting phrase. Are they the same or are they different? Or are they two classes of believers? To the saints and the faithful brethren. I'll leave that with you till next time we'll have an exam. <laughs> no, uh, okay, you don't want to do that, okay. Um, to the saints and faithful brethren. Now, if you want to build doctrine, you say, gee, there are two different groups. I wonder how they're different. Okay. Um, how do you become a saint? You're by being really good and getting being canonized by the church? And that, that, that's a popular concept in the Catholic Episcopal and some other groups. They have this concept that, gee, if you really play your cards right, you know, and, and, and you've got, you really, really got a really good report card, uh, there's a ceremonial procedure by which posthumously or sometime, uh, you know, uh, you can be canonized. I think the term is, it says that you're somehow venerated by the body. 
And I'm not knocking the procedure. Don't misunderstand my flippancy. If, if, a, if a group chooses to somehow honor people that way, I guess it's not for me to judge that. However, that's not what the word saint means biblically. How do you become a saint? Hmm, got a lot of answers. You can't join it. You've got to be born into it, right? How are you a saint? By a divine call. Being a saint is a calling. You are the elect of God. God has demonstrated by your call that you are in Him. Hmm? That's what a saint is. Okay. Now, can you become a saint by practice? Can what you do by honing up and working hard become a saint? No. See, that's the insidious part of the church tradition. I don't want to be here disparaging you know, cultural backgrounds, because I'm sure they all may have some value, but they also have a very big risk. Because it embodies the idea, and the world in general has this notion, so-and-so is a saint, meaning that so-and-so is just magnificent in their performance against some standard. Hey, that misses the point of what the Bible means about a saint. Okay, You can't develop skill and discipline to be a saint. Sainthood is achieved by Jesus Christ, what he did, and you're calling and being appropriate, having that appropriated to you. Okay, that's an election. It's a calling. It's a okay. Now the other phrase, faithful brethren. Ho oh, ho! That's a different deal altogether. Some of you out there, I suspect, aren't faithful brethren, and we're probably in the same club because there's ways we're all not as faithful as we should be. On the one hand, on the other hand, in this room particularly, there are some that I believe before the Lord Jesus Christ have earned the title of faithful brethren. I can think of several here. And uh, that are conspicuously that way, by virtue of having borne fruit. You see now how they're different? You see not two classes of believers. They're saints and faithful brethren. Paul is addressing them both. Do they overlap? I think so. <laughs> I don't know many faithful brethren that wouldn't be saints. Are there some saints that aren't faithful brethren? Sure, there's some people in difficulty that are saved, but maybe sort of not growing where they should. Or And by the way, Maybe that's some of us in this room. You see now how they're different? You see not two classes of believers. They're saints and faithful brethren. Paul is addressing them both. Do they overlap? I think so. <laughs> I don't know many faithful brethren that wouldn't be saints. Are there some saints that aren't faithful brethren? Sure, there's some people in difficulty that are saved, but maybe sort of not growing where they should. Or... And by the way, maybe that's some of us in this room. Was there a time that you felt closer to God than you do now. Chuck did such a beautiful job on this, right, Sunday? Isn't that marvelous? If there was a time when you felt closer to God than you do right now, then guess who moved? You know, and guess which way you moved? Backwards, right? And so uh, we might pray on that, that if there is a time you felt closer to God in the past, you might deal with that in prayer and let the Lord help you uh, uh, regain that proximity because it's intended to be a growth thing. The Christian walk is a dynamic, not a static. You're either growing or backsliding. You're not. You're not. There's no holding patterns, or at least they're pretty unstable. Um, so, um, anyway, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossa, a lot of saints and faithful brethren. Where he's addressing those that happen to be residing in Colossa, and then he has his classic. Pauline greeting. Grace be unto you and peace. Always in that order, of course. We've been through that, right? Grace and then peace. Can't a piece of that grace. Grace and peace. Uh, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and then he gives us thanksgiving. Interesting way to open a letter. When you write letters to friends, do you start with Thanksgiving. It's a neat way to do it. Not a great way to start. I mean, you know, you can always find something. Right? Look at Paul. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Praying always for you. You know, it's another thing about Paul. Um, we're going to see here, uh, but I'll, I'll learn it up front so you can appreciate it as we go. When Paul heard about somebody coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, that increased his prayer burden. 
Isn't that wild? Didn't have to be somebody he brought to the Lord. If he hears about some new believers, you get the sense as you understand Paul that that gave him a greater burden. I mean, he got on his list and he took, he kept that person before the Lord and, 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 and we give thanks to God and our Father and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. These are people he hasn't met. He's heard about them from Epaphras. Epaphras he met, and, and, and Philemon, and a few others perhaps in, in Ephesus that were from Colossae visiting. They went back home and started a church. And as he hears the progress report of that church, Paul takes it personally, praying for you, the people he's writing the letter to who haven't met him, they just heard about him. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye, ye have to all the saints, and for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which ye heard before, in the word of the truth of the gospel. Comma. You know, by the way, Paul seemed to have a tremendous shortage of periods. You know? I mean, periods will go through several hours of things, so I won't wait for periods to stop or I'll lose my train of thought. So we'll go, we'll leap you and I from comma to comma and hope for the best. Um, You'll notice in where we've gone here, we've had faith, hope, and love. They're not in the same order that he chooses to use in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. But they're both here, okay? Uh, because we had the, we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints and for, and for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Faith, love, and hope. And I'm not here to rank them. They're obviously, you know, Intimately linked. Each one is the evidence of the other. You can't have one without the other. And you can get into big theological things about ranking and structuring, and I'm not going to waste our time doing that way. But notice that they are together, the faith, hope, and love. Which is laid up for you in heaven, of which ye heard before, in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. And Now, that's an interesting phrase. We're going to have it twice. We're going to have it twice uh, in here. Yeah, we have it here in verse 6, and we're going to discover it later in verse 23, that according to this, I could argue, I'm not going to press this, but I'll just throw it out, I could argue the gospel has been heard in all the world. Now, if there's people from Wycliffe here, they're really up in arms because they know there's 2,000 tongues to go and so forth, and I'm not going to argue that. They're right. There are a lot of, and that's fine. But the point is there's another view that says the gospel is heard in all the world, and my authority is a several fold in the passage we read in Acts and also verse 6 and 23 in the first chapter of Colossians. Now, what it obviously means is the known world, you see. But uh, which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Interesting how Paul is verifying their spiritual condition by the fruits that he has heard of their faith. How does Paul know if they're saved? Because he hasn't visited them. He didn't know these people. Yeah, but he can inspect the fruit. You see? uh, Go back here, verse 5, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. You know, Paul just wraps that together. He just takes one, follows the other. It's an equation. Faith, hope, love, and fruits coming out of that. Yes, you can talk of the love is the fruit, and you can get into that uh, Galatians 5.22, you know, list them, fine. You can run with that if you like. Uh, uh, that's another way of another way of structuring it, which I'm sure is quite valid. Verse 7, As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. And by the way, verse 8, now that's the, as close as you get to a reference to the Holy Spirit in the Epistle of the Colossians. And if you'll allow me that as an incidental reference, it's interesting the Holy Spirit is sort of conspicuous by His not being named because the issue here, the emphasis, will be on the person of Jesus Christ, His headship, His lordship. And, and this, is, this is not a study in the Trinity. This is a study in the person of Jesus Christ per se. 
So that's why you'll discover that the Holy Spirit, in, that's an interesting contrast of this epistle as opposed uh, to the um, Ephesian letter. Now, um, the other subject we're going to get into as we get in the next few verses is the difference, you know, this whole business of salvation. Um, and the whole uh, business, one of the things to keep in front of us, and Paul's going to bring it in front of us as we go, is that you can't add anything to your salvation. He's going to emphasize it. And this isn't Romans. You know, Romans, we really went through that, right? This is Colossians, and Paul's going to make a attacking a philosophical position more than a theological argument, however you'll notice. Underlying all of this is that very issue that it, because what Paul is burdened by is the completeness, the sufficiency of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And in one of the commentators I, I loved, I came across a little anecdote of the old colored man who says, I did my part and God did his. I did all the sinning and God did all the saving. Right? <laughs> I did all the running away from him as fast as my sins would carry me. And he uh, uh, took after me until he run me down. So I did my part and God did his. And that colorful little anecdotal example sums it up. So, uh, not to confuse with rewards and faithful witnesses and other things that God can give you the opportunity to do for benefit. Uh, it's got nothing to do with salvation, and we're going to see that underlying here. Um, okay. Well, the other theme, if you notice going through here in this Thanksgiving, is that uh, all the way through here, uh, verse 4, since we, since we heard of your faith and so on, for the hope which lay up in heaven, of which ye heard before the word of the uh, truth of our gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world. Um, uh, and, so, and verse 7, as we also learned to paraphrase and so forth, uh, who also declared unto, you as, unto us your love in the Spirit. The, the, what another idea that already uh, starts to surface, even in this little upfront Thanksgiving, is the notion that the gospel is a message to be believed and not a collection of precepts or a code of rules to be obeyed. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we don't have a call to obedience. I am saying that the gospel is a message to be believed, not a set of rules to be obeyed. Now, see, already... Paul is starting, you can, whether it's, whether it's conscious or whether it's the Spirit is, through Paul, starting to address the Gnostic error. And um, so, um, now incidentally, this guy Epaphras is mentioned here in verse 7. He's going to show up uh, uh, frequently in this epistle. Uh, one of his major characteristics you know, that we infer from what Paul talks about him, what his major gift was, he was obviously very devoted, very effective, had a fruitful church. His major skill was fervency in prayer. Fervency in prayer. Gee, how we could learn from that too. I get that question all the time. I've got this guy at work, or I have this relative, or this son, or this father, or this a burden for somebody. You don't badger him and witness, in the, as we would call witnessing. Deadly. What do you do? Pray, you bet. Lord will take care of it. It'll be through somebody, some other party, typically. You pray. Power of prayer. Paul passionately pr- prayed for his flock and, and anyone that he heard about. And we also find those that Paul holds in high regard and is, as being effective were fervent in prayer. Okay. Um, we're going to take from 9 through 14, and we're going to f- discover some interesting things. Paul has induced himself and had his thanksgiving in the first eight verses. Now, verse 9 through 14, he, Paul is going to pray for the Colossian church. And we're going to discover two classes of things he prays for, and they're, they're disturbing. So let's, let's read it through and then see what we can learn from it. Starting verse 9 and finishing at verse 14. We'll take one sweep through first. For this cause we also... Since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father 
who hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then he goes on some other things, but I'll pause here. Um, There are two kinds of things here. If we analyze this carefully... um, Verses 9 through 11, so, you know, so part of the, one of the risks we all have is we see these words so often, they become excessively familiar. We, start, we easily read right through this, and we've heard those phrases before, so we keep moving on. Let's pause and notice something. Verses 9 through 11, see, up till now, he knows that they're praying for him. Now, he's praying for the Colossians, and he says in verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all his might according to his glorious power, and unto all patience and his long suffering with joyfulness. Now you can take that list. When you get home, you might want to do this just for fun. Don't do it for long, because these things become fetishes. But take this and make a list of the things that Paul prayed for them. And recognize that those are things that you need to pray for daily. Okay? What he's really saying is to be, uh, uh, the, the key word back here is to be filled with the knowledge of his will. And that's where the word epignosis is. The, with the super knowledge of God. These are all things that you and I can pray for. I say, gee, Chuck, that sounds great, but what's the point? Well, because verses 12 through 14 are things I'm going to suggest the idea that you shouldn't pray for. Because if you pray for the things from verses 12 through 14, to pray for these is to dishonor God by casting doubt upon His Word. I'm taking an extreme view to get your attention. I won't push this too hard, but I wanted to see how many of you are listening. To pray for the things... Notice what he, now, now here Paul gives thanks for. Give thanks unto the Father who hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance in the saints of light. Hath made us. So can you pray that God should make you fit? That's denying He already has. There's plenty of scripture that says that He hath made you fit. Right? Okay. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Can you pray to be delivered from the power of darkness? Not in the macro sense. Now admittedly, if you've got some... You know, creepy, creepy thing chasing you down an alley. It's a little different. What I'm saying is, you know, in, in, in the theological con- context here is that he has delivered us from the power of darkness. Paul gives thanks for that as a done deal. I mean, it's, it's, it's complete. It's done. Okay. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Oh, dear father, translate us into the kingdom of your dear son. If I pray that, there's a sense in which I'm dishonoring God because I'm casting doubt on his word which says he's already done it. And you see how this builds upon Ephesians? See, if you're familiar with Ephesians, it really lays that all out. Okay? And in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, I don't want to step on any well-meaning toes, but how often have you attended a church, certainly not here, where, where, uh, where, the, where, where the context is Christians, and gee, forgive us for our sins, mentally say, wait a minute, he has forgiven us our sins. Okay, wash us in the blood of Jesus. Hey, we're already washed in the blood of Jesus. We want to be washed every day in His Word, Ephesians 4.4. 4. But in the judicial sense, we are washed when we believe. Give us the Holy Spirit. Hey, he, he, he sealed us under the day of redemption with the Holy Spirit. Okay, oh, Father, save us. Hey, wait a minute. If that prayer is either someone who isn't saved, hopes to be, or someone who is just not sensitive to the grace of God, which says that these particular things are done. Past tense, or be more precise, perfect tense in the English. Perfected, it's completed, it's done. So, um, the, uh, the, the first part, the prayer that Paul has for the Colossians, reflect his deep concern for their growth in grace, their enlightenment in divine things, and uh, their apprehension of the purpose of God in their lives. Hey, those are things we pray for every day. We might more fully understand what God would have of us this day, this week. Right? 
and, uh, and, 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 and to pray for manifestations of spiritual power in your life. Hey, those are valid prayers every day for yourself and for those in whom you have a prayer burden. So let's do it one more time. For this cause we also, Paul saying, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the epignosis, the super knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, wisdom is the application of knowledge, and spiritual understanding, spiritual understanding, where do you get spiritual understanding? With the Holy Spirit, through the Word. Huh? To what end? Verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord. That ye might walk worthy. Hey, you can be saved but not walk worthy. It's called stumbling. It's called being, it's called being in the flesh. Blowing your stack, losing your cool. You know, you got the idioms. Does that mean you're not saved? No, you're saved by Jesus Christ. You're saved by His person, not your person. Praise God. But He says that ye might walk worthy. How do you walk worthy? By being in the Word and praying about it. Unto all pleasing. Now, this is an interesting word. Griffith Thomas points out that this word pleasing does not appear anywhere else in the New Testament. So there's a question of what the Greek word really means. And from other Greek usage, out of the, it apparently means a preference of the will of others before our own. Well, that fits. When you say pleasing, that's what we mean. That we have a preference of the will of God over our own will. Being fruitful into every good work. Aha. Every good work. Are there things in your life that are not sanctified? Trick question. If you're a believer, everything in your life is sanctified. You may not recognize it, you may profane it, but you are, and everything in your life is sanctified, set aside for God. And increasing in the knowledge of God. Again, that epignosis phrase strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. Boy, we could talk about that all night, couldn't we? His power rather than ours. In this group, I don't have to amplify that. Unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Now, this isn't patience in the stoical resignation sense. You know, this is no, no martyrdom con- you know, concept in Paul's mind here. He's talking about patience and long-suffering With a long face, boy, what a spiritual guy I am. Look what I'm putting up with, right? No, with joy and joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light. See, now notice, see, there's a a difference here. The prayer to be fit in the sense of your walk day to day is something you should do every day. The prayer to be fit unto the inheritance he has for us is already done. To pray, you know, how often we hear, gee, I hope the Lord will make him fit to be saved. Now, wait a minute, you know. Um, uh, God didn't die to make us good, right? God died so that we'd be forgiven, Right? He, 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 made, he didn't make us. He didn't die to make us good. He made us. He died so that we could live. Big difference. Giving thanks to the Father who hath made us fit to be partakers. Hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light. Saints of light. Now, interesting. We here's this. Here, if you, if you, if we, if we really wanted to develop the Zoroastrian idea of the duality, here Paul is in effect hinting at we're the saints of light. He's not implying that there's two sides to the force. Light and dark, all of the Star Wars idea, with the Zoroastrian idea. But setting that idiom aside, we are the saints of light, okay? And we have an inheritance. And God has made us fit for that, past tense, done. So what Paul does here is he gives thanks for it. He gives thanks for it. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, so he's made us partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light, hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Paul skirts the error of dualism, doesn't even deal with it, but just points out, setting aside those errors which are conceptual and who cares, he's saying, hey, we're saints of the light, and he's delivered us from the powers of darkness. That's the point. What constructs might lie behind that are irrelevant, as far as Paul's concerned here. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now here's you can use a very non-Jewish, he's dealing with Greeks, really. So he's not going to use the Jewish argument of the preeminence of Christ that he does in Hebrews. 
He's simply saying he's translated us into the kingdom of whom? His dear son. He's going to just bypass the angels and principalities and all these would-be mediators that emerge out of the Gnostic era. In whom we have redemption through his blood. We have redemption through his blood. We don't get that every day, every week. No, we fellowship in it. We celebrate it with the Lord's Supper, yes. But we have a judicial cleansing by his blood once and for all. Once and for all. Or in Hebrews. We have a different kind of cleansing in where we wash in the water of the word. The water and the blood are used differently, idiomatically, in, in, the, in the New Testament. And we wash in the word how often? Daily. You betcha. Right. But here, again, uh, Paul is drawing this interesting distinction. He prays for those things which are edification, strengthening, better walk, and simply gives thanks to those that are already our possession as believers, in whom we have the redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now... What we're going to do next time, we'll touch on now, but I don't think we'll finish the idea. We're now going to get in the next major section, which is, uh, well, it depends on how, where we want to break it off. But verse 15 on starts to open up a couple of other thoughts. Uh, the writer to the book of Colossians um, uses the phrase, uh, the firstborn of all creation. Or the beginning of the creation of God is another phrase that occurs only twice in the New Testament. Once in Revelation and once here in Colossians. But in Revelation it occurs incident to the letter to which of the seven churches? Laodicea. And what's fascinating, as if you're a mystic, as I guilty, I'm using it in a little different sense, is that there are phrases that only occur in the New Testament in the book of Colossians written by Paul, and to the epistle to the Laodicean church dictated by Jesus Christ, penned by John. And those idiomatic links are just another one of the subtle evidences or fingerprints, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. Because Paul was not a mystic. Paul was a practical minister, carrying three jobs, spending most of his time in the can, going on and and preaching uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, setting up churches, writing letters, praying. And Now John was a mystic. You can tell it by the way the Gospel of John is organized, not just the book of Revelation. Gospel of John has more sevens and structure of the book of Revelation, but they're just hidden, they're tucked away underneath the surface. So John was a mystic. So we're not surprised to find some of these things in John's letters and so forth. His use of the word as a title of Jesus Christ. And he's just, that, that's John. But Paul wasn't, and yet, this, this link, the spiritual link, if you will, this idiomatic link between the Colossians and Laodicea, is, the Laodicean letter is interesting. But one of these phrases is this whole business of the first, of the, uh, speaking of Christ as the firstborn. That does not imply that Christ was created, although some of the phraseology in the English may sound like that. Now, there are two idioms that are worth exploring. Um, the first idiom I'm going to suggest is this term, the only Begotten. The only begotten. It occurs five times in the New Testament. Turn to John chapter 1, verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. We're going to talk about John 1, the first three verses, often. So for next time, you might revisit the early the first chapter of the Gospel of John, but right now we're just going to pick up verse 14. And you recognize that John has introduced the Word of God as a title of Jesus Christ. He does that right up front, and he uses that in one of his letters, and also the book of Revelation. It's a title of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the Logos. But in verse 14 he says, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt or tabernacled among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of whom? The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, skip down to verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Okay, and then the next place it occurs, there's five times it occurs in Scripture. The next place is chapter 3, verse 16. I think you know it, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his who? 
only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 18, two verses later, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of what? Only begotten Son. Great. Now, and there's one more time it occurs in 1 John chapter 4, his first, first, John's first letter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. And this was manifested, and in this was manifested the love of God toward us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that He, that we might live through Him. Now, the other place that the word only begotten appeared, five times of Jesus Christ, five times being the number of grace, and we can, we're going to talk about five times He's also called the firstborn. I'm going to come to that, but I want to make a distinction here first. In Hebrews 11.17, we have that phrase used again. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. That's a strange phrase. I thought we had Ishmael rather than, I thought, I thought, I thought Abraham another son. But here it says Isaac was his only begotten son. There's some kind of anti-Arab slur here. Turn, turn, turn to Genesis 22. It's even stranger there. Genesis 22. One of my favorite chapters in Scripture. It's the first place that appears. Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. And, he's, and, and, God, and he said, God is speaking to Abraham, says, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, well, that's strange, isn't it? Now, God is choosing to be blind, if you will, to Ishmael for his purposes here, because Ishmael was a son of the flesh. God had instructed Abraham that he would have a son of the promise, and that's what Isaac is all about. Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. So this is the first place that the word love appears in the Bible. Whom thou lovest. So we have a direct, interesting linguistic link, if you will, to John 3.16, because obviously Abraham offers Isaac on this hill through the whole thing. We've been through this before. 2,000 years later on that very same hill, the high ground there, another father offers his only begotten son as an offering that he loved. For God so loved the world, same word, that he gave his only begotten son, and so on. Now, it's kind of interesting, uh, it's really fascinating to me, is uh, when we discover in da- how David picks, uh, well, he's instructed to buy the thrashing floor of Ornan to build it, you know, that ends up being the side of the temple. That's not the high ground on Mount Moriah. Nowhere when the angel tells David to do that does it make reference to the offer, Abraham's offering of Isaac, which is strange, you'd think there would be. Why? Because that's over a little bit, a little higher ground. And if you look at the topo map of Israel, see where the temple is, there's a little ground a little bit higher up the high part of the Mount Moriah area. It's a place called Gordon's Calvary, where there is a tomb and there is a a good possibility, at least, that it was the the site where uh, Jesus Christ indeed was offered as an offering for sin. Now, this whole business of the only begotten we've talked about, the next concept that's very related to that is the concept of the firstborn. Now, when we say firstborn we're really talking about not the first out of the womb, exactly, necessarily, but it's a position. The firstborn son had position. It was a positional title, if you will. And through the scripture, on the one hand, God establishes the rights of the firstborn because he had the rights of inheritance, on the one hand. But God also instructs us that the firstborn can be set aside for another who will assume the position of the firstborn. He does that with Ishmael and Isaac, who was the firstborn as we would see it in the flesh. Ishmael, who gets the right of firstborn? Isaac. Isaac is the one offered for sin. Isaac is the one for whom Eliezer, the comforter, if you will, gathers a bride and so forth. Isaac is the type of Christ. Isaac is the son of promise, and become, it's in Isaac, his seed shall be called. So Isaac is put in the position of the firstborn here, right? Now, 
uh, as an evidence of this that may interest you, I may have shared this with you before. There is a concept among the Kabbalah, the, the Kabbalistic rabbis, uh, where gematria, the, the, the numerical value of the letters in the text, carries meaning. They have discovered what they call, rediscovered, they believe, what they call the law of the square. Certain the squares of certain numbers are relevant. 49 is relevant as 7 times 7 and so on. 13 squared is 169. 31 squared is 961. It's the only place where the transposition of the number also transposes the square of those numbers. 13 and 31 and 169 and 961. It's an interesting observation. Rabbis have discovered that the opening and closing stanzas of the creation of human Genesis in the Torah add up to 961. In all kinds of key passages, there's an opening or closing phrase, and when you sum the letters, it adds up to 961. They call that, among the rabbis, the signature of God. And when you take Abram, Sarai, and Ishmael, and add up their names, it adds up to 961. When Abram becomes Abraham, and Sarai becomes Sarah, and Isaac is announced, you discover that Abraham and Sarah and Ishmael don't add up to 961. But Sarah and Abraham and Isaac do. It's kind of interesting. So there's a lot going on in these texts that gets this, but we have Ishmael and Isaac. Next example, Esau and Jacob. Who is the firstborn? Esau. Who gets the right of the firstborn? Jacob. Say, yeah, that was through connivory and all this. Yeah, there's a lesson there too. I'm grateful for that. Because if God can justify Jacob, I've got a chance. Reuben and Joseph. Who's the firstborn? Reuben. Who had the right of firstborn? Joseph. Double portion and so on. Joseph has two children, Ephraim and Manasseh. Jacob, the father, i.e. their grandfather, adopts them. Gives them a blessing. Joseph's all upset because he crosses his hands. The guy on the right was blessed. And got, he puts Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Deliberately. The Holy Spirit told him to. Right of the firstborn. Rights of the firstborn. And, uh, and, and yet God is very jealous of the rights of the firstborn. You know, Jacob connives uh, Esau, his brother, out of the rights of the firstborn. And when he deals with Laban, his brother, for Rachel, and gets Leah instead, God uses Laban to teach Jacob what the rights of the firstborn are all about. So a retribution there. Very interesting, you know, the whole aspect of that. And who's the ultimate substitution of the rights of the firstborn? Adam gets set aside for the last Adam who gets the inheritance and through whom we get our inheritance. Not through Adam, but through Christ. See the model? Established in Genesis, again and again and again, exemplified in another than the person of, of Jesus Christ. Now, so this concept of the firstborn is a phrase we're going to encounter in the book of Colossians. Uh, let's let's uh, take a look at that in a couple of places. Let's start with Colossians. We've got our finger right there. First Colossians, verse 15, speaking of Jesus Christ, we're going to have seven superiorities highlighted here, but one of them, he it says, he who is, the, in verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Okay? Now bear in mind, this doesn't mean first, it means it's a positional term. Firstborn of all creation. For by him were all things created. And we're going to deal with this next time, because we don't have time to develop this. For those of you that, uh, verse 16, we're going to, we're going to, get into the first three verses of the Gospel of John and some other passages to talk about what we really mean when we speak of Jesus Christ, the Creator. But anyway, the firstborn is here in verse 15. You can skip down to verse uh, 18. Same chapter, Colossians 1.18. And he, Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Here's this concept of preeminence. Not built in a Judaistic foundation of the Epistle of Hebrews, but in a, perhaps in a more fundamental sense, in a, if I may, um, in, in, in here. And the key verse of the entire epistle happens to be verse 19. If you want one verse that summarizes the epistle to the Colossians, it's verse 19. Whatever that means. For it pleased the Father that in Him, in Jesus Christ, should all the fullness of the Godhead dwell. And we'll get to that when we get there. You might turn to Romans 8.29. Romans chapter 8. Oh, is it hard to get out in and out of this chapter with just a verse? There's so much here. But we're going to try and just take verse, uh, to Romans chapter 8, okay, verse 29. Well, we know 28. We always check. You should mark 28. Because when things are down, always check to see verse 28 is still there. It hasn't been repealed. 
And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Why? That He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. Whom He called, them He also justified. Whom He justified, them He also glorified. And that's, of course, the patriarchs. As you remember from our study in both the Romans and Genesis. Predestination, Abraham. He liked this over. Called Isaac, and I see he shall be called. Justified Jacob. Jacob can be justified, anybody can. Whom he, whom he justified, he glorified. Who? Joseph. So those four major milestones are used by Paul here structurally to make his theological point. Moving on then to Hebrews chapter 1, to take one last place. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. Now this is again where the writer to Hebrews is making the point that Jesus Christ is just not some kind of super angel. All the angels worship him. Because he created the angels. We're going to see that next time. But again, here's this phrase, the first uh, um, begotten. First begotten. Now it's kind of interesting that the only begotten phrase occurs five times in the scripture and the uh, firstborn occurs five times. Slightly different phrases, similar concept. Um, and and uh, it's interesting because, um, if for no other reason, than it's structurally significant. And uh, it's always fascinating to me how Paul apparently planned his letters. So between the Colossian letter and Roman letter, oh, there's one more place, and that's Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, I believe it is. Did I miss one? Yeah, excuse me. Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 5. In the, se- in the chapter, Revelation chapter 1, 24 titles of Jesus Christ are introduced that become identity links with the rest of the, the book. But one of those, in verse 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, and so on. First begotten of the dead. And uh, uh, so there again we have this first begotten or firstborn idea. So, uh, five times, Colossians twice, Romans once, Revelation and Hebrews. I don't know how Paul realized John that the Paul that how Paul knew that John might use the phrase to make it a nice even five for the number of grace that we also we, so we have it in both places. John uses it uh, um, five times the only begotten phrase. Paul and John together use the firstborn phrase five times. It's structurally it's provocative. It shows in my mind. The reason I, I I link up on these things it's evidence in my mind that the Holy Spirit is not sort of casually inspiring these things. He's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, In the beginning God created heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God brooded over the waters, moved over the waters, but it's moved like a hen moves over her chicks. I see the Holy Spirit doing the same thing with this scripture, watching, attending to every detail, every word, every sentence structure. Yes, it's Paul in his style, and yet... The Holy Spirit there is, is busily editing and modifying so that it carries far more impact than any of us would have had any real, uh, uh, real uh, insight into. Uh, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Satan can offer nothing new. And what we're going to embark upon in Colossians answers the New Age and such other heresies as may confront us. But most important of all for you and I in our walk, in our day-to-day, is we're going to be uh, confronted with the living Lord, the headship of Jesus Christ, preeminent in all things. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we praise you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have already as our possession in him our inheritance, our salvation, our forgiveness, but indeed, as, as Paul would also pray for us, we pray that you would indeed strengthen us, help us to more fully apprehend your will in our lives, uh, bring us into that more complete insight and understanding of your super knowledge, your epignosis, of your will in our lives, that in all these things we might grow and grace the knowledge of him and that In these things we might be more pleasing in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.